Welcome to Tabletop Tommies. I'm Johnny. And I'm Phil. And today we're going to be talking about what I think is the worst competitive bolt action army in the game. So it's the nation that would be the most difficult to take to a tournament and win, in my opinion. But before we talk about that, let's go to Johnny for an update on the latest merchandise. Yes, we've got some new mugs on the website so if you are interested in supporting the podcast by purchasing a top quality mug for your for your brew for your brew for painting it can contain any liquid really if i'm honest but if you're interested in such a product head to tabletoptommies.com where you'll be able to peruse the entire range including t-shirts but before we get started just want to say a big thank you to everybody who's jumped on board and started to support us on patreon we really do appreciate it So, Johnny, what is the least, worst, best, most competitive, non-competitive army in bow action, in your opinion? Well, so it is the Armies of Norway, found on page 65 onwards of the Armies of France and Allies book. And the reason I personally think they're not very good is I was stunned when I was reading the book at the lack of choice, the lack of options, and the lack of anti-tank specifically it really is a difficult army to play i mean to be fair johnny that does make sense given the history of the norwegian invasion Mm -hmm. they only lasted 62 days so they were invaded on the 9th of april 1940 germany managed to invade from the sea uh, and they took some some sea forts very quickly they landed some paratroopers captured the airport near oslo and then they also invaded by land as well. Um, so very, very quickly, Norway was was already under threat. It only had about 19,000 troops mobilised at the point of invasion, and it basically wasn't really a professional army, other than the officers. The majority of the army wasn't really professional. So you can kind of understand why within 62 days they capitulated and surrendered. To be honest, if their options were so limited in the real world, I'm surprised they lasted 62 days. Mm. Uh, maybe this is the most thematic army in bolt action, then? It's pretty thematic, to be fair. It's actually interesting, just staying on history for the moment, why maybe it wasn't um, as reinforced as much as it was by the Allies, because Norway is massively strategic. It's um, There's a huge amount of natural resources in terms of iron ore and that sort of stuff. Um, you've got the North Atlantic ports, which Germany needed to be able to, to base their ships there. Uh, and get into the um, get into the shipping lanes across the Atlantic. It also became a source of heavy water later on in the year, which was crucial mm-hmm. for Germany's atomic bomb project. So the Allies knew that Norway was crucial. Germany knew that Norway was crucial, and yet we didn't see a huge number of troops stationed in Norway. Nor was there any real Allied um, attempt to reinforce Norway. There was British. Uh, there were British fleets or ships involved um, at the start on the on the beginning in April defending Norway, defending the coastline, but there wasn't this mass, you know, mobilisation of British troops uh, to defend Norway. What you did have after Norway surrendered was the commando raids going on in 1941, 1942 onwards, etc. But that's uh, that's after occupation rather than, you know, at the point of invasion. Interesting. I must admit, uh, the only thing that I really knew about Norway, so before I played bolt action, was about the heavy water production and the commando raids to sabotage that. And so... It is interesting that really they they don't get a lot of airtime elsewhere. No. So I suppose it's quite nice of us to give them a full episode. Fun fact, they were the most heavily occupied country throughout World War II by the Germans. So for every eight Norwegians, there was one German soldier stationed in Norway. And this was hugely significant because it meant that uh, Germany was keeping forces stationed in Germany throughout the war rather than being able to then redeploy them to like the Eastern Front, for example, or before that, maybe to have used them in the Africa Corps. Um, And that was one of the reasons why Churchill was so keen on the commandos throughout the the war um, raiding Norway, because the Germans had to then keep forces stationed along the coast in key ports, in key fishing villages, all that sort of stuff, to prevent then the the sabotage and the quick raids going on by the commandos. So actually really interesting that it tied up a huge number of German troops throughout the war, which couldn't be redeployed and used on the fronts. Hmm. All that sweet, sweet heavy water. Got to protect it. Yeah, and fish oil. And all. Glycerine as well. Yeah. Oh, lots of stuff going on there. Lots of stuff. All vital for the war effort. Anyway, let's jump back into the actual game rather than the history. Yep. And so 
Johnny, I mean, why are they rubbish? Let's start with the army special rules. Well, their army special rules actually aren't too bad. Okay. So you've got... The first one is the same as the French. They've got the communication breakdown where if the first order dice drawn from the bag is yours, your opponent can choose to put it back into the bag. Mm -hmm. The first order dice of the game usually doesn't matter that much, so it's a bit irrelevant. Yeah. They also have the fieldcraft special rule, which I think is shared with other nations. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe the Partisans get this. Any Norwegian unit which starts the game hidden can also start an ambush okay which is pretty nice the shame is that um they don't really have much long range stuff you would want to be in ambush anyway yeah but the other nice perk of that fieldcraft rule is on the first turn they get to treat all rough ground and obstacles as open mm. so they can run through forests and stuff on the first turn which is pretty interesting so that would be really useful if you had a norwegian unit armed for example with smgs so you can get in nice and close before the beginning of turn one and start hitting them with those two shots per man. Indeed, if without too many spoilers, if such a beast existed, the special rules might have a purpose. Okay. And then their final special rules infiltration, where much like I think the Finns have this as well, where when outflanking, their units ignore the minus one modifier when testing to come out of the table. Yeah, it's the same as um, behind enemy lines. So the commandos get that and the chindits, for example, in, in the British lists. Yeah. And what's quite nice here, actually, is in a lot of other places you see this, it'll be like the infantry or vehicles get it. Here it's just any Norwegian unit. Mm -hmm. So their national characteristics, I mean, they're nothing to write home about, but they're not bad, are they? They're not Italy bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler for a future episode. Yeah. yeah. But the real problem is when you get to the actual units. And so the headquarters are pretty uninteresting. Second, first lieutenant, captain, major, available, inexperienced or regular, not veteran. Mm -hmm. But I don't know anyone who's taken a veteran major, so not the end of the world. They do get skis for freeze. Nice. Cool. You can have a medic, just regular. Yeah. Or you can have a forward artillery observer. The forward artillery observer can't be veteran or inexperienced, just regular. Mm -hmm. And that's basically all their HQ choices. Again, fairly standard, really. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing major missing there, is there? No, there is a major. <laughs> right. Moving on. Indeed. So, their infantry sections, or rather, their infantry squads, you have a total of three choices. Okay. You can have regular infantry, yeah. inexperienced infantry, or you can have the Royal Guard, who are your veteran infantry. That's all you need? Well, <laughs> <laughs> you've got... So you're regular and inexperienced. Their only choice is a light machine gun. Yeah. Up to 11 men. So again, an awkward number of men as well, if you want to go for that full-size squad bonus. Full strength. Full strength, yeah. If you want the full strength bonus, 11 men I always find a bit of an awkward size, but... These two squads aren't bad. They just they just don't have much punch, do they? Yeah, they're a bit meh, really. Yeah, it's like the kind of thing that in most other armies you just sort of skim over. Yeah, yeah. Like looking for the exciting stuff. The Royal Guard are mildly more exciting. Mm -hmm. So again, up to 11 men starting at five. One light machine gun is an option. Mm -hmm. But these guys can also take Molotov cocktails and improvised explosives, counting as anti-tank grenades. Okay. For two points a man. So normally... That's not worth it, is it? But actually, if you are planning to play a Norwegian, I think you're probably going to have to do that. Yeah, it needs mustard and all that. Yeah. Obviously, once we get to the later sections to see what other anti-tank is available, mm -hmm. um, you may find yourself disagreeing with me, but <laughs> I'm going to say now <laughs> that I think you'll probably be agreeing with me by the end that these anti-tank grenades are going to be a must. Okay, cool. So, effectively, I think if I'm building a Norwegian force, I'm going to build Royal Guard, with anti-tank grenades, that's... Yeah, yeah. You can't go wrong with veterans, can you? No. Sadly, no SMG, so that kind of rules out my cunning plan of forward deploying... or not forward deploying, sorry, of running through with field craft uh, on the first turn and shooting away with my SMGs. Exactly, yeah. No SMGs, no VB launchers, no tough fighters, no stubborn fighters, no fanatics. You've basically just got the most generic troops it's possible to have in mm. world action, basically. Yeah, yeah. So that's your infantry squads okay in terms of teams we've got the classic machine gun team only up to regular mm -hmm. you've got the sniper team this one you can take veteran and the assistant does have a pistol okay hey we got some tough fighters at last <laughs> yes you can have one tough fighter in your force i suppose you could you could give your chief a pistol as well couldn't you mm, true yeah actually you could even give him a submachine gun 
the boss. You really want to push the bait out. So maybe that's justification for taking that captain you've always had your eye on. Mm -hmm. uh, with three or two mates and an intelligence officer. Yeah, so yeah. you can have four SMGs in your army. There we go. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, so yeah, your sniper team, I think you're always going to take one because it's as good as any other sniper team. And you're not spending your points on infantry so much, so you might as well throw in a little sniper. I think you're going to struggle to actually fill a thousand points as well, to be fair. Yeah, if you don't take the Royal Guards <laughs> and it's single platoon. Uh, yeah, at 11 man per section, yeah. yeah. Everything in the army can have skis as well, just cool. to save me saying it for every single entry. <laughs> yeah. So that's medium machine gun sniper team. There are some mortars, only light or medium. Mm -hmm. Again, nothing to write home about, can't be veteran. I'm, I think I'm going to put a medium mortar in, mm. just... Because you need something in your force that isn't just a royal guard, don't you? Yeah, definitely, yeah. And then, so that's everything, basically, apart from your artillery. Okay. Your artillery choice, you've got one choice for an artillery piece. Yeah. It is a 40 points regular light howitzer. Comes with a gun shield, three-man team. Fairly standard light howitzer. Mm. However, mm -hmm. they've added a nice special rule to this one called no anti-tank round. <laughs> okay. So that... It only gets plus one to pen when firing at an armoured vehicle. Right. So usually that wouldn't be a huge problem. If that was in something like, I don't know, a British list, you're generally going to rely on sort of light anti-tank, peart, flamethrower to deal with your tanks. So that's not really a problem. The problem with that rule for the Norwegians mm. is they have no armoured vehicles. Yeah. And so... That plus one pen howitzer is your only anti-tank outside of the anti-tank grenades. Mm. I can see why you're saying this is the most difficult list to play competitively. Yeah. Yeah. And so the last two entries are, you can have a Jeep equivalent, yeah. just sort of a, a generic Norwegian car. Yeah. I can't think of any Norwegian car manufacturing brands at the minute. I'm sure there are one. Mm -hmm. And you can also have a truck, but the truck does not have the option for a machine gun. So that is just a 12-man transport with no offence. Okay. <laughs> wow. And that is your force. Yeah, yeah. I mean, while we're here, we might as well do their one theatre selector as well, which is the Battle of Norway. Mm -hmm. It's basically the generic platoon, except your compulsories, you can't take Royal Guard. And then in your optional, rather than getting three infantry, you can have up to four infantry. And that can be any of the three. It's like a normal um, theatre selector, then you get six... Infantry squads, potentially, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's basically a generic platoon, but you get one more troop choice. Brilliant. It does mean, however, that two of them can't be Royal Guard. Yeah. So, I mean, if I'm going to build this list, I think I am just going to put five full-strength Royal Guard squad with anti-tank grenades. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Take the howitzer, take the mortar, take the sniper team, and I think that's probably my list. And two inexperienced five-man squads as your compulsory, because you have to. Oh, I, sorry, I was building it as a generic platoon. Oh, I see. Sorry, yeah. I was going to make you play, play as a theatre selector. Sorry. Oh, no. Um, I mean, yes. If if I'm playing as a theatre selector, I probably would just spend the... Um, <laughs> <laughs> buy the cheapest compulsory ones, yeah. Okay. Because really, the, the veterans are the only thing I think the whole army has going for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really not very good. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Imagine if someone brought, I don't know, a tiger against you. <laughs> yeah. Which famously is bad in bolt action, but if you can't even touch it yeah. at range, I don't know how you're going to do anything about it. No. Because, yeah, I mean, that list that I've just said where you've got five Norwegian guards, uh, five Norwegian royal guard, mortar, artillery, sniper, mm -hmm. you're only getting sort of 10 dice as well. So it's not even like you've got an army that's really spamming and taking a hold and you can really steal the advantage that way either. Mm, interesting. Yeah, it's a real tough one, isn't it? I'm struggling, to be honest, to say anything other than it's a bit rubbish and I really can't see how you do very well unless you've got, like you said, generic reinforced platoon, five squads of vets, tool them up with AT grenades, max them out where possible and hope that you don't come up against a bunch of Gurkha Powers or uh, a barbecue list or some fanatic mad Japanese. Or anything. Or, to be honest, anything, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, I was going to ask you how you would build this army, but you really don't have a second choice, do you? There, no, there isn't, to be fair. It's, it's, not even, it's, it's a question, but it's not really given me many options to answer with, if I'm honest. <laughs> I suppose the only other way 
would be to just take lots of inexperienced yeah. and just multiple platoons of your terrible howitzer. Okay, yeah. So if it was multiple generic platoons, you could spam your uh, inexperienced guys, max them out at 11, 11 per squad, get as many howitzers as you can, hope that you're playing a mission with prep bombardment, hope the prep bombardment comes in against your opponent, hope you roll a load, roll a load of sixes, hope that they roll a one and you don't get prep bombardment, and then slow play so that you don't finish turn six and you've just about got enough troops by the end of this game and you're okay. <laughs> I, mean, I have to say, because we said I said earlier, this is the most probably the most thematic bolt action army you could play because it's probably going to survive as long as the Norwegians did in the real world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. I do feel like that no anti-tank round rule that they put on the howitzer, which... I don't know any other how it's in the game that's only plus one pen against vehicles. Mm. It's just so unnecessary to add it in. Mm -hmm. Clearly, the author of Armies in France and the Allies was either having a bad day or just there was a previous issue with somebody who was Norwegian. No, I think it's just one of those ones where they've 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 read that it was bad against tanks. Yeah, They've added the rule because it's thematic. And it's very much that thing where you do something in isolation mm. without sort of thinking about the wider context. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So to give them the benefit of the doubt. Okay. So the other thing is I don't even think warlords sell models for Norwegians, do they? No, they don't. No, you can get a very nice range from Great Escape Games. So if you are inspired to play bolt action on ridiculously difficult mode and you fancy building a Norwegian army, you can get them from Firestorm Games. And if you use the link in our description, not only will you get a great discount, you'll also be helping us and supporting the pod at the same time. Nice. Do you have any Great Escape models? I do. I have some Great Escape uh, Winter Germans, so Stalingrad Germans, and they're very, very nice. And they do scale well with, well, certainly my Winter Germans from Great Escape Games scale well with the Warlord Winter Germans. Oh, nice. Uh, but they do they do look really cool. Um, I do actually recommend Great Escape Games. Great Escape make uh, a really good range of the more random esoteric and slightly odd armies that you might want to play in bolt action nice i don't think i've got any great escape if i'm honest mm. i'll have to get on it i'll have to use the link to support the pod you should do <laughs> yeah now there is one other thing worth noting if you those of you that have got the early bolt action books in germany strikes which was one of their theater books and not the campaign book mm -hmm. there's a tiny little reference it's buried halfway through um, to a generic allied Norway defence force. And this is a general purpose allied selector for players to use when creating their own scenarios. And it consists of Norwegian, British, Polish and French forces, which presumably reflected some of those units that were available in Norway at the time. Mm. Um, so what it allows you to do is to kind of mix and match a sort of um, smorgasbord of allied troops at the beginning of the war. So you can take British, French and Norwegian medics, uh, officers and artillery observers. You can't take any air, air forward observers um, because allied air cover was woeful. Um, you can take British early war regular or inexperienced infantry squads. You can take French regular inexperienced or foreign legion squads. So you can get some veterans, possibly with some SMGs as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can take any infantry squad from the Norwegian selector, and you can also add some regular Polish squads. You do finally get an AT option because you can take a British or French boys anti-tank rifle. Mm -hmm. You can take British, French or Norwegian light and medium howitzers. So you're going to take the British one because that's the 25 pounder with the plus four pen AT. Mm -hmm. um, you, you could, if you wanted to take British or French light AT guns and a British anti-aircraft gun. You can take any unarmoured British, French or Norwegian tows and transports. And the best bit, you could take British brain gun carriers, Vickers Mark 6B light tanks, or the French Hotchkiss H39 tank. So you might just about be able to squeeze in a couple of anti-tank options in that list. Yeah, the British brain gun carrier, because mm. that's not in your transport slot. I presume it's going to be the recce carrier. Oh, that makes sense because it's because you can't it, yeah because you said no one armored so that makes perfect mm. sense. So it perfect. sits in the armored vehicle, but mm. you might yeah you might want to take the Vickers Mark Six light tank or the French Hotchkiss. Yeah. Uh, there's a few like limitations, not not that you've already got some anyway. <laughs> you can't take anything veteran. Communication breakdown applies. You have to take rapid fire for any British troops. You can't take um, anything else. Infiltration only applies to Norwegian troops. 
and no other French, Polish or British army special rules other than the ones I just mentioned apply. But that's kind of cool from a sort of like smorgasbord, mix and match, cornucopia, early allied Europe list. Well, I'll tell you what's cool about that as well. The fact that like this is such an early campaign book, mm. but they've done such a good job of clarifying how these troops from different nations work in terms of national characteristics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which in some of the, even some of the more recent campaign books, it's sometimes a little bit unclear about how you, what's going on with the national characteristics. Like, for example, Western Desert's one where I can never quite get my head around what they, in, what they intended to happen with the national characteristics. And that's where you get your sort of your free Indians combined with the free FAO, don't you? Mm, more on that in a future episode. <laughs> Indeed. So did you say what that was representing? Uh, so it is called the Generic Norway... So Generic Allied Norway Defence Selector. Um, and it's... It's the the fluff around it says it's for people to write their own uh, campaigns. But is it so? Is that like the troops that were in Norway before the war, because there was sort of British and French troops there already, or is it sort of like a small raiding force? Because I thought it was like a commando raid type scenario until until we got to the armored vehicles. So this is the troops that were in Norway at the time of the invasion in April 1940. There was a very small Allied expeditionary force. This will be why there are British and French troops in the in the um, selector. And the Polish troops will be because the Poles, prior to them surrendering, I'm assuming the Poles who escaped and fled to France and Britain were then assumed, sorry, were then subsumed into the Allies' forces and then formed part of the expeditionary force that went back across the Channel to defend France and the Low Countries and Norway prior to the invasion in April 1940. Nice. I don't really have anything else to say on that. Um, History Hour with Phil. Yeah. Um, I was trying to think of a jingle there. I thought I had a jingle for you, but I can't think of it. <laughs> so, Johnny, um, will we see you taking a Norwegian force to an event so that you can play bolt action on ridiculously difficult mode with your arms tied behind your back at the same time. I'm tempted. Not going to lie, because it's a fantastic excuse for not doing very well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think anyone who takes Norwegians to a tournament, especially a competitive tournament like the yeah. Welsh Nationals, and doesn't finish last, yeah. I think deserves an incredible award. I'd say so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think as well, actually, one of the things that we don't see much at bolt action tournaments that I think we could probably do with in the long run is at these bigger tournaments where, we're, where we've got sort of at least 40 players, mm. a best in faction award, I think, could encourage people to dip their toes into these not good or at least not as competitive armies. Yeah. And if there was a best in faction award, I think I'd definitely would try them out at a tournament just to see how difficult it is basically mm -hmm. very i imagine yeah i'm imagine if you took them and you did well like how surprising would that be yeah true to everybody because actually we're saying they're terrible and they are in a way but actually you could have a string of luck here because i think as long as you didn't face a strong counter like lots of armor or people who are just pushing into your face to do close quarters. Mm -hmm. A rifleman is a rifleman in bolt action. So actually, I don't feel like your points are being badly spent per se. It's just that you don't really have any particular strengths. You don't have like one thing to hang your hat on and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the best at this. And that's the problem with it, I think. It's like the least worst best option. Yeah. So I suppose something like envelopment, if the Norwegians were defending, they might be all right there, you know? Like... Just or if all you have to do is just string yourself on the back back edge and repel the attack, mm -hmm. potentially maybe. No, I think you are somewhat clutching at straws. Yeah, but anyway, <laughs> if anybody's got a Norwegian army in the UK, can you let us know, and then we'll rock up to an event. Johnny can play them, and then we'll report back on the pod how we got on. Yeah, and if anyone's got a Norwegian army somewhere else in the world. <laughs> And you think they're not as bad as we've made out, or even if you do think they're as bad as we've made out, actually, please do let us know, because obviously all of this analysis was done entirely from the book. I've never seen a Norwegian army, so I've no idea how they actually play no. in the real world. Um, I assume you've not seen one either, Phil. Uh, no, I haven't. <laughs> no. Well, as ever, thank you for listening. Please do leave us a review on your podcast player of choice. Please also like, share, subscribe. And it's Tatar for now from me. And it's Tatar for now from him. Thank you.